All Saints Church in the village of Brailsford is delightfully situated half a mile from the A52. The church only makes itself known as you walk down the aptly named Church Lane and you still have to look carefully through the trees to be aware it's actually there. Known as the Church in the Fields, Brailsford All Saints is part of the united benefice of Brailsford, sharing its manor with Edniston. It's said that people have worshipped here for over a thousand years, with links to the Doomsday Survey of 1087. As you approach, the old stable, a Grade II listed building, sits on the left of the church gates. Above the entrance, a carved stone quotes, This stable was built at ye expense and for the use of the parish in 1754. The stable has since been converted into a toilet for the church. The stable mounting block sits at the right of the church gate. The churchyard, accessible through the main gates, takes on various identities during spring. Snowdrops pushing through the ground gives us the first indication of a change in the weather, soon followed by a yellow blanket of daffodils confirming summer is approaching. Patiently waiting in the queue, the bluebells change that yellow colour palette of the daffodils to a violet blue canvas that bluebells are renowned for. The unmissable yew tree opposite the church door stands proud, with its huge arms spread out as if to welcome all. Being a guardian of the church for over a thousand years, it's hard to imagine how many events and celebrations it has witnessed. At just a few steps, a surprise discovery was found when digging the grave for the late Reverend Fairfax back in 1919. The diggers unearthed a Saxon cross believed to date back to the 10th century Saxon era. The carvings on the stone have some striking similarities to the Repton stone, which depicts a Mercian king from the 8th century. Finding the cross here gives us a hint that the area was a place of worship well before the church was erected. For those with a keen eye, there are three sundials built into the church. Finding them all can be a bit of a challenge. The first of the three, displaying signs of how old the church is, sits above the porch door. A bit more identifiable, the second sundial is built into the wall of the south aisle, just above the roof. And finally, the sundial that many would not know was there, blink and you'll miss it, carved into the wall next to the old chancel door, you can just make it out. On the west wall of the south aisle, just below the kitchen window, a carved slab is inlaid into the wall. It depicts an incised cross with scrolls that seem to be shears engraved. It is believed that these may have been a memorial to a merchant sheep farmer. Glancing up at the church, you see things that you would otherwise miss. Completed in 1485, the bell tower has a gargoyle set into each corner. Each with its own features, they look out as if to watch over the churchyard. The porch is now the main entrance to the church. As the date above the door states, the upper part of the porch was built in 1624. Looking closely, you will see two initials either side of the date. These are believed to be the initials of the church wardens at the time it was rebuilt. As you enter the church, you pass through a wooden inner door alive with history, believed to be at least 400 years old. As amazing as the door is, its lock has a wow factor. Its age and size are astonishing. You can only imagine locking the door centuries ago. Moving into the church through the porch, we walk over to the nave. The nave dates back to the Norman times, although it's thought there were Saxon foundations under the north wall. The wooden benches in the nave were installed back in 1884. Each bench has its own unique carving, based on those found in the 16th century churches of North Devon and Cornwall. The carvings depict biblical stories and events about the death and resurrection of Christ and Christian symbols. The benches were a gift from the Clement Borton Kingdon, a church warden from Devon and Cornwall, and lived in Edniston Lodge for a time. In the 
the left corner of the nave sits the pulpit, a later addition to the church installed in 1934, a gift from WG Player along with the altar rails and the beam spanning the tower arch, a commemorative gift for the birth of his granddaughter. Moving naturally on towards the chancel, the first thing to demand your attention is the great east window, a wonderful mosaic of blues, reds, greens and yellows. It depicts the story of the Good Samaritan. The window was installed in the late 1800s. Turn your gaze to the right and you will see a three-seat sedilia set into the south wall, as is with most churches. These seats are used by the officiating priests in times gone by. Just to the left of these and also built into the wall is a piscina, a small niche for washing communion vessels. Opposite on the north wall we can see a small wooden door to the vestry. This was an addition to the church built in 1860. The original intention was to add a north aisle which would have provided more seating. However, this was deemed to be too expensive so only the vestry was built. Moving around you can't miss the church organ, a sound unrivaled by no other instrument. This fine organ was commissioned in 1914 and built by Harrison and Harrison. Moving back out of the chancel, we take a look at the south aisle of the church, dating back to the 12th century. As with the nave, its benches have similar carved ends with their own unique story to tell. On the south wall of this aisle you will notice an arch shaped board. This is the rector's board and shows a record of all the rectors from the 13th century onwards. Next to this is what is known as the poor board. This board records gifts made to the poor of the parish in the early 18th century. Lastly this board shows the royal coat of arms which is a 19th century copy of the original. At the east end of the aisle, the font sits in its present position since 2002, being moved from the west end of the aisle where the kitchen now resides. Having moved several times over the centuries, it now sits in the same position it occupied in the Victorian era. The arcade separates the nave and the south aisle and is structurally made up of three pillars and two support ends. The west respond or half pillar and the west pillar are clearly Norman. The middle pillar is a replacement, probably added at the time the chancel was built. The east pillar is an octagonal structure and it's believed it had the same form as the west pillar but was carved down whilst in situ to match the middle one. Once the home of the font, the kitchen area took on its new role in 2002. Still in place above the kitchen are two large reminders of the Ten Commandments and two prayer boards all from the 19th century. The tower was constructed in the west bay of the nave. It's believed that the earlier tower at the end of the nave collapsed and this tower was built to support the end of the church. The tower houses six bells. Three of these date back to 1717 two back to 1816 and a treble installed as late as 1956. Brailsford All Saints Church requires a huge amount of effort to provide a service to Brailsford, Edniston and beyond. The local volunteer support network are the bedrock of Brailsford All Saints, providing a large pool of skilled volunteers, 
ready to help out and take part in local and topical events, religious festivals, regular coffee mornings and the usual church activities. To honour the reign of Queen Elizabeth and celebrate the coronation of King Charles, a joint project was born. Brailsford All Saints and Brailsford Methodist Churches came together, along with the whole of the Brailsford community, to create the magnificent Brailsford Bayer Tapestry. Over 10 metres long and made up of 400 plus embroidered squares, the tapestry was created by a mix of experienced stitchers and contributors who have embroidered for the first time. Along with help from the children of Brailsford Primary School, the Brailsford Bayer was created and placed on display in Brailsford All Saints for the first time. <laughs> 